February of 2005, Danielle Imbo and Richard Patrone walked out of a South Street bar in Philly and disappeared. No evidence as to what happened, no bodies, no truck, no clues at all. Danielle was just coming into her own. She'd worked in car sales, the financial industries, eventually discovering that she enjoyed working with mortgages. She met her husband Joe when he needed a new car. After his clunker broke down, he walked into the dealership, saw a pretty girl, and they started dating almost immediately. They married about a year later in 2002. They would go on to have a little boy who they would name Little Joe. A few years later, Joe would leave his wife and six son home in order to attend the 2004 Super Bowl. When he returned home from his trip, Joe would announce that he'd met someone on the plane to New Orleans and that he wanted to be with her. He moved out, relocating to Georgia, but the new relationship didn't last. Months later, in the middle of their divorce proceedings, Joe asked Danielle for another chance. By this time, however, Danielle was casually dating her best friend Christine's brother, Richard Patrone. While they weren't serious, he treated her well and she wasn't interested in going back to Joe. Joe kept pushing her to reconcile, and in the winter of 2005, he came over so angry he bounced the baby's car seat off the wall. After Danielle's brother John changed the locks at her home and warned Joe to be civil, Joe responded by calling Richard at his parents' bakery, warning him to stay away from his wife. Richard, on the other hand, was a mellow guy. Unlike Joe, he was not prone to fits of anger. He worked at his parents' bakery, raising his daughter alone in an apartment above. He doted on his daughter and loved music. At 13, his daughter decided to live with her mother, and while she still stayed with him a few nights a week, he found himself with a lot of extra time on his hands. Smitten with Danielle for years, he decided to go ahead and ask her out. They had been dating a while when Joe began pressing her to get back together, and Danielle eventually decided she didn't want to date anyone at all. Although disappointed, Richard understood. That fateful night in February of 2005, Richard was looking for someone to have drinks with. He hadn't heard from Danielle in weeks. He'd been eating alone that night in a South Philly bar. He found himself texting his sister Christine, seeing if she would like to meet him out for a drink. His sister Christine was out that night enjoying a ladies' night with their mother Marge and two longtime friends, Felice and her daughter Danielle. This was a complicating factor in Richard and Danielle's relationship. Danielle was Christine's best friend, dating all the way back to high school. In addition, both of their moms were good friends also. Christine declined to meet for a drink, but the question was put to Danielle, who agreed. Two hours later, the reunited couple looked happy together. Richard told Danielle he'd drive her the 30 minutes home to Mount Laurel, New Jersey, before returning to his place in South Philly. After a few drinks, they headed out into the frigid night air from the Abilene's bar toward Richard's truck. No one would ever see them again. Danielle's ex-husband, Joe Imbo, had a rock-solid alibi for February 19th, one that placed him 50 miles away at a kid's party with his stepfather, who was an ex-NYPD officer. There were multiple active police officers at the party itself who could verify for Joe's whereabouts. Joe Embo took a lie detector test, but the police declined to announce whether or not he passed it. The police have stated that there is not enough evidence to arrest Joe, but they've also stated that they have received many tips that it was a contract for hire case. A complicating factor is that the two of them should not have been together that night. So if there was a contract killer out for one of them, it's impossible to tell which person it was. If someone did hire a contract killer, that would likely make Joe Embo the prime suspect. The police have been clear that they cannot rule him out. Danielle's family and friends were shocked when the police told them that Joe not only knew his wife's passcode, but he'd been listening to her voicemail and monitoring it. Robert Carey, the alleged leader of a Kensington area prescription pill ring, was rumored to be the hitman. Others who knew Carey, however, described him as more likely to beat someone up versus killing them. If Carey is the murderer, it's unlikely that anyone will ever know for sure, as he killed himself in prison in 2010. Another tip led police to Anthony Rodeski. Rodeski had been convicted of murdering two men in the course of separate robberies, and marshals even dug up Rodeski's former basement but found nothing. The greatest sadness for those left behind is not knowing what happened to them. Richard's daughter is now 23 and she works at a grandparent's bakery. She has a son she named Timothy that she wished could have met his grandpa. Richard's mother and father still break down over their son's passing, but just want to know the truth of what happened. They found themselves unable to move on. His mother once said, I don't blame people for not wanting to be around us. We used to be fun and now we're always sad. Danielle's mother Felice wakes up daily and cries before getting up. She said she feels sick all day long every day. Danielle's brother John openly describes himself as bitter. Joe Imbo, the ex-husband, gave an interview stating that he hasn't had it easy either. He suffered a heart attack at the age of 37. He also describes himself as bitter. He says that the only person in the world that knows he didn't do it is him. 
He also admitted that it's difficult because Daniel and Richard were only together by chance that night. He had a possible motive that can be attributed to him wanting either one to be hurt. He says he knows that he will face suspicion until the real murder is found. Patron's missing vehicle was a 2001 black over silver Dodge Dakota pickup truck with Pennsylvania license plates YFH2318. There's a $50,000 reward for information leading to the discovery of what happened to Daniel and Richard. If you have any information at all, please call the number on your screen. Another couple that disappeared together are Tom Hawks and his wife Jackie. Tom was a Vietnam veteran and a father of two boys. He had a dream to retire early and live on a boat with his wife. He made that dream come true. He saved and invested his money for decades, eventually buying himself and his wife a 55-foot trawler yacht for about $300,000 and naming it the Well Deserved. The couple outfitted the vessel with the latest technology and enjoyed traveling from Newport Beach along the West Coast down to Mexico. It wasn't until they were about to become grandparents that they decided to sell the boat and move back to land. Their dream had changed and it became about their love of their grandchild. On November 12, 2004, the couple traveled to Santa Catalina Island off the coast of Los Angeles to sell their beloved yacht. They had decided to sell the boat themselves in order to save steep brokerage fees, and they had found a buyer relatively fast. Their last trip would be traveling to Santa Catalina Island off the coast of Los Angeles. The couple's tight-knit group of family and friends knew that Tom and Jackie Hawks had gone with their prospective buyers to take the boat out for a test ride. Then all of a sudden, radio silence. No one was able to contact them for days and this was extremely out of character. Tim's brother Jim Hawks decided to go check on them and went to where the boat was moored. The boat was still there but their Honda CRV was nowhere to be found. Jim left a note on the well deserved for the new buyer to contact him. It was Jennifer DeLeon who called him back telling him that her and her husband Skylar had bought the boat and that they hadn't seen the couple since the day they went for the test ride. They also claimed to have paid for the boat with a suitcase full of cash. This made Jim Hawks suspicious and he reached out to Trisha Schutz, a friend of the family who managed the missing couple's finances while they were traveling. Schutz made it clear that if they were given cash, they would have deposited it in their account immediately. The account had not been touched. Jim Hawks, as a result, filed a missing persons report. Newport Beach began looking for the couple two weeks after they disappeared. The detective is now retired and said publicly that the man who claimed to have paid cash, Skyler, was a convicted felon on probation. The police immediately suspected foul play. Skylar Delian had a troubled childhood. He considered himself a struggling actor, something he'd been since a child, and his most prominent role was as an extra on the 1990s TV show Power Rangers. Later, he met his wife Jennifer online, got married, and they had a little girl. He was expecting another child with her at the time that the Hawks went missing. Jennifer, a hairstylist, was the only breadwinner for the family, and they lived in a converted garage behind her parents' home in Long Beach. Given their living situation, it seemed highly unlikely they could afford to pay cash for a yacht. The police searched the well-deserved, and they found a receipt from Target. Two days after the Hawks disappeared, somebody went to the store and purchased Tums, trash bags, and bleach. Target was able to provide the surveillance photos of the purchaser to the police, but investigators who expected to see Skylar or his wife Jennifer were surprised to find Steve Henderson, Jennifer's father, in the photos instead. The police later learned that Jennifer had sent her father to buy the bleach. Jennifer would go on to claim that she was concerned about the couple's whereabouts, as she'd been trying to reach them ever since buying the boat. She said they had a lot of property, clothes, and items they didn't know what to do with. The police felt she was telling the truth and seemed to be genuinely concerned about the couple's whereabouts. Skylar produced paperwork for the boat's purchase, complete with signatures, fingerprints, and a notary public certification. Much to their surprise, Skylar openly admitted that he had used drug money to buy the vessel. This was especially surprising since he was a felon on probation for armed burglary. Claiming he was trying to do better, he wanted to be a good father, invest some money in a way that would support his kids. Skylar told the police that he paid the couple for the well-deserved with a briefcase full of cash. He had witnesses for this transaction. They were his wife, his child, a notary, and a friend from Mexico named Alonzo. According to Skylar, it was a short event. They exchanged money and got the keys to the yacht, after which Tom and Jackie drove off in their silver Honda. Nearly a month after his parents vanished, Ryan Hawks was urged by his uncle to go to the media to ask the public for help. This effort would break the case wide open. A retired American couple living in San Miguel, Mexico, heard this plea for help. They immediately reported that the vehicle in question had been parked next to a mobile home in Mexico the entire time. The mobile home's owner told Mexican authorities that he didn't know Tom or Jackie Hawks. He instead told the police that the car had been given to him by his friend Skylar. It was at this point that the police were positive Skylar had murdered the couple, but they had no proof to arrest him. 
On December 17, 2004, police opted to arrest Skyler on money laundering charges while they continued investigating him for the murder of the Hawks. Investigators searched his home, finding the Hawks' laptop and their video camera, which the couple was using as their own. For months after Skyler's arrest, Jennifer continued to insist her husband was innocent in the disappearance. She even declined the offer of immunity in order to say what happened to the Hawks. The case took a new turn when the search of the Delian home turned up a Newport police officer's card. It turns out this officer was working as a liaison with Mexican police in order to investigate the death of John Jarvie. Jarvie was found in Mexico with his throat cut in 2003. Jarvie and Skyler met when the two were serving time in the city of Seal Beach Jail, where some inmates were allowed to go out during the day on work release. After Jarvie was freed, he stayed in contact with Skyler, who promised him a big score. Skyler pitched Jarvie a business proposition to make a large sum of money. As a result, Jarvie gave Skyler $50,000 in cash. The two of them traveled to Mexico for the big score to take place. However, Skyler was the only one to return to the United States. John Jarvie's brother Jeff would later tell 2020 there was never any deal in Mexico, that it was all a ruse. Skyler murdered his brother and came back to the United States with the cash. Things further fell apart when Kathleen Harris, she was the notary who certified the paperwork for the sale of the well-deserved, went into the police station and admitted she never met the couple. She had nothing to do with the murder and she was given cash to backdate and notarize the documents. Skyler's friend Alonzo, who was also there at the time of the sale, was next to reveal his role in the murder. He told police that he first met Skyler when he was in jail at the city of Seal Beach. He played an active role in murdering the Hawks. He later said that Skyler convinced him that he was an international hitman and that he needed to take out Tom and Jackie Hawks because they were evil. He identified an additional accomplice named John Kennedy and together the three men overpowered Tom Hawks and handcuffed him alongside his wife Jackie. It was then that he taped the couple's eyes and mouths shut and tied them together. By this time Skyler had begun navigating the boat out to the deepest part of sea. They proceeded to tie the couple to one of the yacht's anchors and eventually threw the couple overboard. Jennifer was next to be arrested. It turned out that while she wasn't present for either murder, she spoke with her husband multiple times on both days, offering guidance on how to succeed. After Skyler carelessly threw the couple overboard, he went on to toss their photographs and other personal belongings overboard like a frisbee. Skyler and the two men proceeded to fish on the way back to Newport, as if they had not a care in the world. In 2006, Jennifer was convicted of the murders of Tom and Jackie Hawks and later sentenced to two life terms without the possibility of parole. She was charged and connected to Javi's murder, but that charge was dismissed. Alfonso was given leniency and sentenced to 20 years. John Kennedy was sentenced to death for the double murder. Nearly five years after the Hawks were murdered, Skyler finally faced trial. He was found guilty of all three murders and sentenced to death. He currently sits on death row. I hope you enjoyed today's stories. If you haven't yet, please hit the like and subscribe button. Take care of yourself and each other.